Okay. Okay. Uh, so for your chapter one review, I did uh, post the the answers right here, so you can uh, just make sure. I'm pretty sure that everyone was consistent with what the answers are, but just to be sure, uh, the answers are posted uh, there. And again, we only did uh, just a limited amount of that, but um, answers are posted there. And then after we are finished with the chapter two, I'll post those answers as well. So uh, you have your uh, study guide. So we have an exam on Tuesday and uh, that'll be uh, fill in the blank, short answer, essay. So um, uh, do you have any questions? Okay, so uh, my goal for today, finish chapter two, start chapter three, and then finish up with, uh, we have, with the chapter two review sheet, we had uh, number four, uh, B and E, uh, were the two that I asked you to complete there. So uh, let's jump back in. Okay, so we covered, uh, So we covered uh, three different stages of um, metabolism. So stage one was glycolysis. And so if there is sufficient oxygen, we go from glucose to pyruvate. And then the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria. And then we have stage two. Uh, what is pyruvate converted to in stage two? Our common intermediate, what's that? Yeah, so acetyl-CoA, uh, and then stage three is the Krebs cycle, uh, where we finish breaking down uh, everything. So the, the, everything that we had uh, with acetyl-CoA is then broken down. So how many acetyl-CoA do we have uh, with a glucose molecule, ultimately? So we go glucose to 2-pyruvate, and then 2-pyruvate to how many acetyl-CoA? Two. Two. Yeah, so the Krebs cycle goes around once for each acetyl-CoA, and so all the hydrogens and associated electrons are then shuttled by, what are our two hydrogen carriers? FAD. Yep, FAD and NAD. And where do they take those uh, hydrogens and electrons? Electron transport. Uh-huh, electron transport chain. And so that's where we pick up. Uh, after stage three, we have... Uh, stage four, which is oxidative phosphorylation. Why do we call it oxidative? Yeah. So oxygen is the final hydrogen ion electron acceptor. And uh, so if, if you remember your chemistry, um, hydrogen, has, uh, hydrogen has eight protons, which means it has how many electrons? Eight, if it's stable, so um, it will have, do you remember energy levels with your chemistry? <laughs> Maybe? No. Okay. So at any rate, it has room for two more electrons in its outermost shell, which is perfect because it can there then share those electrons with how many hydrogen atoms? Two. Two hydrogen atoms. So it's a polar covalent bond to make an oxygen molecule, polar covalent bond to make an oxygen molecule. So um, we have water at the end of all this, but we have to have oxygen waiting at the end of that electron transport chain. So this all takes place uh, in the mitochondria. So uh, we have a micrograph of a, of a mitochondria in here, and we can see the crystal. The crystal are these uh, indentations. Um, we have two parts of the mitochondria that are important. Uh, we have the inner matrix and then we have the intermembrane space. So what is anything with the prefix inter means what? Inside. Inter is, is means between. So the intermembrane space is between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So you notice mitochondria has some DNA. And so all the cytochromes 
the proteins that are involved in this shuttling of electrons, uh, can be synthesized locally uh, right in the mitochondria uh, due to this limited amount of, of DNA. Where's the other DNA in the cell? Yeah, the large majority of the nucleus. But the mitochondria is able to uh, take care of itself because it has its own uh, DNA there. So mitochondria have to be uh, recycled a lot because they're constantly used uh, for ATP production. So um, mitochondria are very important and actually connected with the aging process. So there's a lot of research going on that show that um, the aging well is also connected with functional mitochondria. And so uh, as we exercise, the mitochondria are replaced more frequently. Uh, they're larger and they're, uh, we have more of them. Okay, so let's just dissect this messy slide. Okay, so first key point, rate limiting enzyme of the electron transport chain is oxidate, uh, is, is cytochrome oxidase, cytochrome oxidase. So we listed two rate limiting enzymes previously, one as part of the Krebs cycle and one as part of uh, glycolysis. Do you remember what those were? For glycolysis, it's, so PFK, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on the exam, if you say PFK, that's, that's good. So phosphofructokinase. Uh, what about the Krebs cycle? So the one that starts with an I, all right? <laughs> every, every year I have to rememorize, so don't worry. You're not the only one. So isocitrate dehydrogenase. So we have those three rate-limiting enzymes. So I will ask you that, guaranteed. So you've got to memorize three of them. Um, Wait, is the PFK one cyclical or no? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, okay. So the other key point: um, ATP from the electron transport chain is produced via oxidative phosphorylation. So we talked about oxygen as being the final hydrogen ion electron acceptor, um, but the shuttling of electrons involves a series of oxidation and reduction reactions. So you have four complexes that are in the, mito, uh, the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this is the inner membrane right here. This is the, the matrix inside. So that's this lighter color. And then the intermembrane space that we talked about. So you have four complexes as well as the cytochromes that function as electron carriers. So complexes one, three, and four are embedded in the inner membrane, whereas complex two is attached to the membrane on the side of the matrix. And then you have coenzyme Q, as well as cytochromes B and C1, as well as cytochromes A and A3, those are proteins that shuttle electrons from one cytochrome to the next. So these cytochromes are just shuttling electrons, for example, coenzyme Q from complex one to complex two, and then from complex two to complex three. Okay. So the other uh, significant part of this has to do with this enzyme right here, ATP synthase. So what can you tell me about synthase just based on the name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it makes, so it makes ATP, ATP synthase synthesizes uh, ATP. So essentially we're, we're putting ADP back together with inorganic phosphate to make to make ATP. So in your textbook, these are referred to as ball and stock complexes. So you kind of see how they look like a, a ball and a stock, um, but they're really made from ATP synthase. So we have three sites, one, two, and three. Three sites where we are rebuilding ATP. Okay. 
So you might ask, okay, well, how did we get the ADP and the phosphate in there to begin with? How did we get that into the matrix? Well, if you look on the right at the very end, uh, once we have finished making ATP, we can swap it with ADP in the cytoplasm. So out here, outside the mitochondria, that's, that's the cytoplasm, right? And so we can swap an ATP that we made uh, as part of oxidative phosphorylation. We can take that ATP and shuttle it out to the cytoplasm, and we can shuttle an ADP into the matrix. So you have this swapping that takes place. Um, the inorganic phosphate is also shuttled into the mitochondria and then into the matrix by this uh, protein called phosphate translocase. And so in addition to the phosphate, we also bring in a uh, hydrogen ion. Okay, so my next question, uh, for NADH plus a hydrogen ion, how many ATP do we make? What's the average? So two and a half. What about FADH2? How many do we make? One and a half. Okay, so here's the reason why. Um, it has to do with the location where NADH or NAD drops off its hydrogen versus the location where FAD drops off its hydrogen. So can you, just taking a look at that, and I know there's a lot of details there, can you look at the first point, which complex where NAD drops off its hydrogen? Can we? Yeah, you see the first one, that is correct. So uh, NAD drops off its hydrogens and electrons at complex one. Okay, so where does FAD drop off its hydrogen and electrons? Yeah, so we have complex two here. So Essentially, the hydrogen electrons from FAD is skipping one of our ATP synthase complexes. So that's at each of these complexes is an opportunity to make ATP. So that's the reason. So with the hydrogen and electrons from NAD, uh, those hydrogens and electrons are used at one additional ball and stock complex versus FAD, which if it's dropping off here, then those hydrogens and electrons are utilized here and here. Okay. So next thing, the hydrogen and electrons are separated. So we call it the electron transport chain, not the hydrogen and electron transport chain. So it's the electrons that are transported along this chain of complexes. So what are we doing with the hydrogens then? Well, we have proton pumps that pump the hydrogen from the matrix out here to the intermembrane space. And so if you've studied chemistry and know anything about concentration gradients, you've got this high concentration of hydrogen ions building up in this intermembrane space. And so can you see how these proton pumps are shuttling these hydrogens out to this intermembrane space? So those hydrogen ions are accumulating in this space. So we can also think of these ball and stock complexes as like uh, gates. And so if, this, if these gates open, where's the hydrogen going to go? From the area of... It's high concentration towards the area of lower concentration in the matrix. So we call this an electrochemical gradient. So an electrochemical gradient creates movement. And so the movement of hydrogen from the intermembrane space through these gates combined with the shuttling of electrons through these complexes is what provides the energy to put ADP and PI back together. So stated very well right here, this quote from your textbook, the formation of ATP from ADP and PI is coupled. What does it mean for something to be coupled? Happens together, right? Or happens at the same time. Is coupled 
to the movement of hydrogen ions through the ball and stock complexes, which we said, okay, that's ATP synthase. Okay, so movement of hydrogen through the ball and stock complexes from high concentration to low concentration and electron movement along the electron transport chain. So right at the very end now, we see that oxygen accepts two hydrogens to make, always happens, to make water right there. So that's kind of the, the whole scheme of it. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, so let's let that settle in. Let's, let's talk a little bit more. So here's an oxygen atom, right? So it has eight protons in its nucleus, which means if it's stable, it has eight electrons. So we have these energy levels where the electrons orbit the nucleus. And so these electrons are kept in their orbits due to the opposite charge from the protons. So the electrons have a negative charge. So in the first energy level, we have two. So if we have a total of eight electrons, how many electrons are we going to have in the second energy level? Six. Yeah, we're going to have six. So in the second energy level, for oxygen to be stable, it has to have eight. And so how many more electrons can oxygen accept? Two. Two, to be stable. So what it does is it shares electrons with a hydrogen atom because each hydrogen atom has one proton and how many electrons? One. So two hydrogen atoms means that oxygen can share those additional electrons it needs to be stable. So uh, we make uh, water. So again, that's a, that's a polar covalent bond, which means that um, those electrons are shared unequally between hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so summary of carbohydrate uh, metabolism. So first thing, I want to direct your attention to where I've circled this right here. So we go through glycolysis. We break down glucose to two molecules of pyruvate. So that's a 10 step process. So when we have sufficient oxygen, pyruvate is shuttled into the mitochondria. Now, in step six, you see how there's a little arrow going from step six, we make two NADH plus a, hy plus a hydrogen ion. Now, what did we learn was the key difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle? Do you remember? It ha it'll, it'll come out in the total ATP tally. There's a shuttle difference between skeletal and cardiac muscle in terms of, you see this arrow right here, and encircled here, uh, NADH plus a hydrogen ion or FADH2. So in skeletal muscle, which one is it? In skeletal muscle, Is it NADH plus a hydrogen ion passing those hydrogens directly to NADH plus NAD, or are these hydrogens passed to FAD? Yes. So let's go back just a little bit. So in skeletal muscle, there's a different shuttle to bring those hydrogens into the mitochondria. And so it's actually NAD passing those hydrogens to FAD. So skeletal muscle is the glycerol phosphate shuttle. Uh, whereas in cardiac muscle, it's the malate aspartate shuttle, which is NAD to NAD. So the difference is two ATP because two NADH plus a hydrogen ion equals how many total ATP? 2.5 per 
molecules, so 2.5 times 2 is 5. So if you're starting from glucose in cardiac muscle, the net, you end up with 32. But in skeletal muscle, if these hydrogens are actually passed to FAD, that's 2 FAD versus 2 NAD, how many ATP do you get from 2 FAD? Three. So five versus three. So that's a difference of two. So rather than 32 ATP in cardiac muscle that we get from one molecule of glucose, how many total ATP do we get in skeletal muscle from one molecule of glucose? It's, it's 30. So that's the difference. So that's, that's significant because that's a little more energy that we uh, are able to yield in cardiac muscle due to how we get the hydrogen and electrons in the mitochondria. Okay, so the second point I want to make on this slide when you're doing exercise four, uh, part B, this is the slide you want to pay attention to because this slide has will help you with each of those steps that you're trying to match on exercise for uh, part B uh, later today. Okay, so the ATP balance sheet, uh, we went over that. So what does substrate level phosphorylation mean? Substrate level phosphorylation, what is that? What does it mean to phosphorylate something? You're yeah, so we're, we take a phosphate from one molecule and transfer it to another molecule, right? So we have a net total of two ATP from substrate level phosphorylation during glycolysis if we start with blood glucose. What if we start with glucose that is from intramuscular, intramuscular glycogen? What's our net? ATP from glycolysis? Two or one less. One less. One. So the net total is, is three. Okay, so again, glycolysis, you can start with glucose from the blood or you can start with glucose from intramuscular glycogen. So if we start with glucose from the blood, how many ATP are we, are we investing? To start the process. Glucose from the blood, we're investing, let's go back. That's a lot, I know it's a lot to keep straight. So here we are. Okay. So we can say, okay, so we're getting we're getting glucose from the blood. So we're going to invest one. In reaction one, we're going to invest another in reaction three, but then we are making four later on. Because remember, everything happens twice after reaction five. So we spend two and we make four. What's our what's our net? Two. Is is two. Okay. So if we get the glycogen or glucose from in, intramuscular glycogen, um, we're only spending one. And we still make four, so our net would be would be three. Okay. So the other good question from this slide is, what's the difference between slow glycolysis and fast glycolysis? Well, the first question is, do we have sufficient oxygen? If we have sufficient oxygen, is it going to be slow or fast glycolysis? You said we have sufficient oxygen. If we it's have slow. sufficient oxygen, it's going to be slow glycolysis, and we're going to get the glucose from, from the blood. If we don't have sufficient oxygen, it's going to be fast glycolysis, and we're going to get the glucose from intramuscular glycogen. So fast glycolysis is what we traditionally think of as the glycolytic pathway. Okay, so the glycolytic pathway, insufficient oxygen, 
it's 11 steps, so we add a step down here and we convert pyruvate to, to lactate. Okay, so we convert pyruvate to lactate so that we can produce quick energy to meet the energy demand. Once the exercise is over and we're back into a rest period, what happens to the lactate? It's not a waste product. Yeah, it's simply converted back to pyruvate. So brain cells, cardiac muscle cells, other skeletal muscle cells, even within the same skeletal muscle cell, lactate is simply converted back to pyruvate. So how, how long does this process take? Does it take days to clear lactate from your muscles? Lots of myths out there about exercise, you know. It takes about 35 minutes for lactate to be completely cleared from your muscles and converted back to pyruvate. So lactate, lactate is kind of in a transient state. It's, it floats around your bloodstream and inactive muscles and heart muscle can take it in and, and use it for ATP production, but it's not a waste product and it's not out there making your muscles sore and it takes days for it. So you have to do all this foam rolling and everything. Um, so there's a lot of myths about exactly what lactate is and all it is is just a temporary energy substrate because once everything returns to rest, it's just gonna go back to uh, pyruvate. So, what do we call conversion of a non-carbohydrate source to glucose? What's the G word? Gluco neogenesis. Okay. So, so there are some cells that can take in lactate, and rather than converting it to pyruvate, they might convert it to glucose. And so you can take that glucose that you got from the lactate, and then if it's an inactive muscle, it might store it as glycogen. So what do we call the synthesis of glycogen? Another G word. Glycogenesis. Glycogenesis, right? What do we call the breakdown of glycogen? Another G word. Lysis. Yeah, exactly. Lysis versus genesis. Okay, so just the, the glyco as, as the prefix. So taking a non-carbohydrate like lactate, taking it into an inactive muscle, converting it to glucose that we can then store as glycogen, uh, that's, that's gluconeogenesis. Um, so take note on exercise E today. So you're asked to do exercise E. There's a question on there about gluconeogenesis, and then it has in parentheses the Cori cycle. C-O-R-I, the Cori cycle. So just think of Cori when you think of Cori cycle. Okay, so that's taking lactate and converting it to glucose. That's the Cori cycle. Can we take certain amino acids and convert them to glucose? That, that came up, although I'm not testing you at this point on protein metabolism, that comes in a little bit later. Yeah, we can. Isn't it, it's amazing. Our bodies love glucose, so we can take other nutrients and we can make glucose. So we can take branched chain amino acids, especially, Okay, so that takes place in the liver. We can take those amino acids, and what are they again? So we, we listed them briefly on Tuesday. So leucine, isoleucine, yes, valine, okay. There's one more that we tend to use in gluconeogenesis. It's called alanine. So there's four amino acids that are commonly used. The, the branch chain ones can be converted to glucose. And then also alanine can be converted to glucose. So here's, here's the point. So why are we talking about protein if I'm not testing you on it? So on today's exercise, you'll see another uh, example of gluconeogenesis on exercise E. 
So we call that the phalig cycle, F-E-L-I-G, the phalig cycle, converting an amino acid like alanine or any of your branch chain amino acids into glucose. So what did we call the lactate to glucose? Or recycle. And then the amino acids to glucose is the phalig cycle. So that should help you when you get to part E uh, on today's uh, activity. Okay, so are we clear on glucose versus glycogen, gluconeogenesis, the reason we make lactate. So why is it that sometimes we use the term pyruvic acid? And why is it that we sometimes use the term lactic acid? So you might be looking at these slides thinking, okay, well on some slides I see pyruvic acid is the end product of glycolysis. And then pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid. And then on some slides I see pyruvate and lactate. In this textbook, there's a quote by your author relatively early on that says we use those terms interchangeably. So at this point, I don't want you to think of pyruvate and pyruvic acid as different. I don't want you to think of lactate and lactic acid as different at this point. So as we go further, especially into chapter three, we'll talk about the difference between lactate and lactic acid and why that's important to note. Okay, so can we go back? We good? Okay. So before we get to um, fat metabolism, I just want to clarify, what is the common intermediate? Acetyl-CoA. So amino acids can be converted to acetyl-CoA. Fatty acids are converted to acetyl-CoA. We get acetyl-CoA from pyruvate. So a question, how many ATP do we ultimately get for each round of the Krebs cycle? In other words, per molecule of acetyl-CoA, what is our total ATP? Because this will be important for fat metabolism. Mm -hmm. 10, yes, good. So how do we get to 10? Substrate level phosphorylation, how many? Reaction, five. Substrate level phosphorylation, that's one that we get directly. So indirectly we have, we have how many NADs? Three, and three times 2.5 is 7.5, correct? So then how many FADs do we have? One, and how many, F, how many ATP per FAD? Mm -hmm. One and a half, so seven and a half plus one and a half is, is nine, right? Plus the one we get from the substrate phosphorylation. So every time we have an acetyl-CoA, that's our common intermediate. So everything is the same once we get to acetyl-CoA. We're always going to make 10 ATP from each acetyl-CoA. So whether acetyl-CoA is coming from amino acids, whether acetyl-CoA is coming from glucose or fatty acids, once we get to acetyl-CoA, we know that that's eventually going to result in and nine ATP from the electron transport chain, but we get one here. So we can just say every acetyl-CoA is gonna give us 10. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so that makes things really easy because with the ATP tally on glucose metabolism, it's really hard to keep everything straight and where everything comes from. With fatty acids, we make a lot more, but it's really easy because it's only involved two parts. So let's, let's get into that. So what are the two parts? So fat metabolism is referred to beta oxidation. What I really like about this, this textbook is 
It has practical stuff, but if you're one of those people that really likes to dig in and find out why it's called beta, then you can go ahead and, and get into that. Just know that beta oxidation means a breakdown of fatty acids. Okay, so it's a cyclic series of steps that breaks off successive pairs of carbon atoms. How many carbons does acetyl-CoA have? Two, right? Two. So every fatty acid has an even number of carbons. Every single fatty acid has an even number of carbons. So if we have a 16 carbon fatty acid, how many acetyl-CoA's can we make? Eight. So how many ATP do we get from each of those acetyl-CoA's? 10, so what's the total? 80. Isn't that easy? Okay. All right, so acetyl-CoA's, two. So every fatty acid has an even number of carbons, so we immediately know how many acetyl-CoA's we're going to have. We also get some additional ATP from this process of beta oxidation. So in the process of converting a fatty acid to acetyl-CoA, we also get NAD and FAD. So we'll talk about that. Because for one molecule of palmitic acid, palmitic acid is a very common fatty acid, we have a net of 106. ATP versus one molecule of glucose, it's, it's 30 or 31 if you're getting glucose from intramuscular glycogen. Okay, so triglycerides are the greatest source of potential energy, limitless supply. We store triglycerides in adipose cells as well as in muscle cells. Uh, constitutes at least 10 to 15 percent of body weight in average young males, 20 to 25 percent body weight in average young females. Uh, it's important because we don't store very much carbohydrates. So we have limited glycogen stores in the liver. The liver is responsible for maintaining blood glucose. We have a little bit more glycogen in skeletal muscle, but it's still in limited supply. So it's nice to be able to have triglycerides always there to provide a backup if needed. So generally at rest um, with our basal metabolism, we're using about 50% fatty acids, 50% carbohydrates. As we go from rest to exercise, we increasingly rely on carbohydrates under normal circumstances with less reliance on fat. So it's interesting, in, in, if, if you work out really, really hard, really intense, there's this afterburn effect, this, this excess post-exercise oxygen consumption that we can have for several hours after a workout where the percentage of fat calories that we're expending at rest as we go through, the, through this recovery process is increased. So this, this post-exercise window is really important because that's an important tool we can use for weight management and improving our body composition because fat burning processes in the body are elevated during this post-workout state. And it can last for up to several hours. Uh, so exercise has a major impact on, on how our body is able to use fat versus carbohydrate. Well-conditioned people are better at using fatty acids. It doesn't matter if you're a well-conditioned anaerobic athlete or a well-conditioned aerobic athlete. At rest, we tend, to, we tend to, to spare carbohydrates and we rely more on, on fatty acids. So that's, that's the good news is our, our bodies become more accustomed to using fatty acids as we, as we achieve better physical condition. So we know fat provides more energy per gram. So 
it's energy dense, 9.31 calories per gram, uh, carbohydrate and protein are slightly less at about four. Um, the difference has to do with the amount of carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so take this as, as an example. Uh, this is the chemical formula for one molecule of palmitic acid. You can see 16 carbons versus six with glucose, 32 hydrogens versus 12 with glucose. So if we, if we have fatty acids, why does the body like glucose? It has to do with the amount of oxygen. Fatty acids require more oxygen to metabolize versus glucose. Fatty acids take more time and more oxygen to get that ATP versus, versus glucose, which is easier for the body to break down. Okay, so this is beta oxidation. So this series of steps we take pairs of carbon atoms and through a series of reactions, we convert these pairs of carbon atoms into acetyl-CoA, okay? So acetyl-CoA enzyme A. So just like glucose, we have to use some ATP to get the process started. So we invest some ATP. So remember, at the beginning, we go from ATP, it's a little bit different, to AMP. What does AMP stand for, do you think? Adenosine, not di, but di is two. What's one, yeah, adenosine monophosphate. So we count that as two ATP, like the equivalent of energy equivalent of two ATP. So that's the energy investment to get this whole thing started. Okay, now through the process of beta oxidation, to take this pair of carbon atoms and eventually get acetyl-CoA, we get one NAD. And so how many ATP is that? For NAD is how many ATP? <laughs> two and a half. And we get one FAD. That's one and a half, right? So what's two and a half plus one and a half? Four. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, every time we go through beta oxidation, we're making four ATP. So for a molecule like palmitic acid, how do we know how many times we're going to go through beta oxidation? So it has 16 carbons. So we use this formula right here to determine how many times we go through this cyclical series of steps. So N is the number of carbon atoms. Now hang with me now. Palmitic acid has how many carbons? 16. Okay, so 16. 16 divided by 2 is what? 8 minus 1 is 7. So for palmitic acid, we have to go through this process of beta oxidation seven times. Seven times. Okay, so we said for every, every time we go through beta oxidation, we make potentially how many ATP? We said four, right? For every... Every cycle of beta oxidation, we make four. So again, where do those four come from? Because we, one NAD is two and a half, one FAD is one and a half, so that's four. So we determined that for palmitic acid, because there's 16 carbons, we have to go through beta oxidation, how many times? Seven. So what's seven times four? 28. So, at the end of beta oxidation, how many acetyl-CoA's are we going to have? 
16 carbons. And acetyl-CoA has how many? Two. So how many acetyl-CoA's are we going to have at the end of all this when we're ready for Krebs cycle? So we went through beta oxidation seven times. And we potentially made a little bit of ATP, but at the end of beta oxidation, we have all these nice acetyl-CoA's that each have two carbons. So if we started with the 16 carbon palmitic acid, how many acetyl-CoA's are we gonna have? We have eight. So we go through beta oxidation, we potentially have some ATP there, four for every round of beta oxidation. And then at the end of beta oxidation, we're sitting there with these nice two carbon acetyl-CoA's. Okay, so due to beta oxidation, you told me we have potentially how many? 28. And then we have acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is gonna go where? What's the next step? Krebs cycle. And how many ATPs do we make per molecule of acetyl-CoA? 10. So if we have eight acetyl-CoA's times 10 is 80. What's 80 plus 28? 108, but how many did we invest? Two, what's our net? 106, does it make sense? So on the exam, what if I gave you an 18 carbon? Not a 16 carbon, what if I gave you an 18 carbon fatty, fatty acid? Would you, would you be able to, same process, right? 18 carbon fatty acid. 18 divided by two is? Nine minus one is? Eight, so eight cycles of beta oxidation. How many ATP per cycle of beta oxidation? Four. four. Eight times four is? 32. So if it's 18 carbons, how many acetyl-CoA's are we left with after beta oxidation? Nine. How many do we get per acetyl-CoA? 10, so that's what, 90 plus 32. Right? 122, how many did we invest? Yeah, 120. Okay, so does it make sense? Everybody okay? Okay, is it easier than glucose? A lot easier than glucose, okay. We're good. Okay, so let's take a look. What are your fuel sources in your body? So for, for the most part, the reason why I haven't gone into amino acid metabolism yet is because we don't use amino acids very often. And we, our bodies really want to preserve muscle tissue, so a lot of the amino acids will come from breaking down that lean muscle tissue. Um, so for the most part, we'd rather rely on, on carbohydrates and fats. So if you see the total energy here, uh, so... Apparently, this was made based on an average adult male, 65 kilos with a 13% body fat. So we're qualifying these results based on that person. So looking at the grams, so you should immediately notice that we have a lot more glycogen in muscle than we do in the liver. And that translates too because... Um, I like this. This is kind of interesting over here. How many days would these baseline fuel sources last? So just basal metabolism with, with no activity, um, this amount of triglycerides, 8,450 grams of triglycerides, would last 47.46 days. Uh, 80 grams of liver glycogen, 0.19 Day. So you can see, if you're not eating carbohydrates on a daily basis, your liver glycogen can be depleted in just a few hours, right? Because 0.19, I'm not exactly sure how much, what's 24 times 0.19 would give you how many hours. Um, muscle glycogen, about a day, 1.07, okay, just basal without any activity. Uh, and then this, the glucose that you just have circulating, uh, 0.05.
So then if we're, we're expending energy through walking or even running, uh, the values tend to drop. So for walking, uh, you're using more of the fuel. So in addition to basal metabolism, you have to expend calories to do the activity. So you can see these values start to drop. And then with running, um, I wanted to underline this. It's kind of hard to see otherwise. Um, running along at 8.7 miles per hour, which is like a about a seven minute mile. Okay, so you can see running, you've got 5,223 minutes with, if you're if, assuming you, you were gonna use all of your triglyceride stores, which is, is not the case, but just for comparison. Liver glycogen, 20 minutes. Uh, muscle glycogen gets you through about two hours. So when do marathon runners typically hit the wall, do you think? You hear that concept? It's about two hours, two hours in. So their bodies are very efficient at going through that fuel transition, converting uh, from carbohydrate to primarily fat metabolism. Uh, circulating glucose about five minutes. So some interesting numbers to think about. So <clears throat> this brings up an important practical question, showing the emphasis on fuel sources at different exercise intensities. Um, in chapter four, we'll get into a concept called the respiratory exchange ratio, which tells us the percentage of fat and carbohydrate we use uh, during aerobic exercise. Uh, so one of the questions you might get, you might have a roommate or friend that's not an HHP major, and they might say, well, how can I burn the most fat during exercise? The question that I like to think about is not, not just during the exercise, because exercise is probably gonna last, what, an hour at most, under most circumstances. What, if, what, what about what's happening after exercise? So the, the other 23 hours of the day. So I, I think what we have to, the, the real question is not just what's happening during the exercise, but also what's happening afterwards. So we have to consider the percentage of fat versus the total fat calories. So if, if someone's able to do higher intensity exercise, so they have no cardiovascular or other orthopedic limitations, and, and they're able to, to exercise with a really high intensity, um, I like to recommend high intensity exercise, not because we're burning a lot of fat calories during, because during high intensity exercise, what, cal what, what type of calories are we using? What does our body like? Readily available glucose, okay? A lot of it's gonna be kind of shuttling back and forth between a very high oxidative metabolism and then across the anaerobic threshold to glycolytic but high intensity exercise, we're not using a lot of fatty acids. See, as you can see, it's low or negligible. So what I like to think about is not just during, but what's happening afterwards. So with high intensity exercise, we have a greater afterburn effect. And that's what I like to go for. That's what's gonna make a bigger difference in your body composition is this afterburn effect. So rather than just having a high percentage of calories coming from fat during the workout, which is, you can see, less than 50% of max, you are using a very high percentage coming from fatty acids. But after a workout that's really low in intensity, your body's going to come back down to a resting state pretty quickly. So the afterburn effect is gonna be pretty negligible. It's not gonna make that much of a difference in your body's uh, internal state. It's not hard to recover from a really low intensity workout. So you're not gonna get much of this afterburn effect. So again, if someone, no cardiovascular limitations or orthopedic limitations, they're, they're able and willing to do high intensity, that's great because you might be using a very low percentage during, but it's going to be the total considering the several hours afterwards where your body and muscles are going to be 
recovering and repairing that makes the big difference. So it's important to keep that perspective uh, in mind. Okay, so any questions? Okay. What, how are we doing on time? Half hour left, okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, let's, uh, let's look at the study guide because I'm not gonna see you between now and when we have the test. I will be looking at email though. I'm not as concerned about chapter one as I am with making sure you're good with chapter two. So looking over those, do you see anything that you're concerned about or that is confusing? So question four, what metabolic pathway might be most emphasized? 400 meter sprint. Well, look at the duration. And it's like, um, yeah, some phosphagen. Yeah, I won't argue with that, some phosphagen. Yeah, it's gonna be glycolytic. Okay, so then gymnastics ball, fluid, then dang, it would be phosphagen, uh, marathon, okay. Okay, so everybody's good on duration and energy systems. Rate limiting enzymes, remember that's, that's in there. Substrate level phosphorylation, where does that take place? What are the two, st uh, two steps of glucose breakdown where we have those? What are the two stages where we get substrate level? Glycolysis stage one, and then there's Krebs, cy Krebs cycle step five, right? Substrate level. Everything else is oxidative because those that's where the hydrogen and electrons go into the electron transport chain for that. Okay, uh, let's see, that's uh, 10. Oh, here's a good one. So please explain what, why metabolism involves a series of steps to break down food molecules rather than breaking down a molecule at once. Why don't we just explode a molecule and release all that energy? Why is it the same series of steps? We're gradually going from glucose to different breakdown products, 10 reactions to make pyruvate, which is still only partially broken down from glucose. It would, it would waste a lot of energy as heat. So in order to trap the energy within the ATP molecule, we want to release the energy slowly is the answer. So again, a lot of the, breaking it down all at once would release or waste a lot of the energy as heat energy versus making ATP with the energy. Number 13? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's... Could okay. you summarize the whole one? We were talking about the ketones and stuff like that. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so how does the ketogenic diet work? Okay, so if our, if our carbohydrates are depleted, if we are in a fasting state or post-exercise without refueling, so it's very, very important to eat after exercise rather than waiting. So our bodies are going to, let me just go back to that slide. Okay, 
so usually what happens is that if we have sufficient carbohydrate, uh, acetyl-CoA will combine with oxaloacetate to form citrate. So acetyl-CoA has how many carbons? Two. Oxaloacetate has four. So they'll combine to make a six carbon uh, citrate. But, but in cases where our glycogen is depleted or we're fasting or post-exercise without refeeding, the oxaloacetate is, con is converted to uh, glucose. Okay, so what do we call that? Conversion to glucose of a non-carbohydrate would be gluconeogenesis, okay? Because our brain doesn't store carbohydrates, so this happens in the liver. Oxaloacetate in liver cells is converted to glucose. Where does the glucose go, do you think? In the blood, it goes, yeah. Goes to the brain. Okay, brain has a limited capacity for anaerobic metabolism, so it has to have glucose to work aerobically. Okay, so if we're lacking carbohydrates, we're going to start relying more on fatty acids, right? So with we go through beta oxidation of fatty acids, we go through all that process, and we're left with a bunch of acetyl CoA. We just we just talked about that. So beta oxidation, we're left with all of these two carbon acetyl CoAs. Well, okay, so remember, this is the common intermediate, right? So breaking down oxidizing fatty acids, we're left with acetyl CoA, but now what are we missing? Oxaloacetate is diverted into the gluconeogenic pathway. It's not there anymore. So what are we going to do with the acetyl CoA? So we convert it to ketone bodies or ketones. Ketone bodies or ketones. What are the ketone bodies or ketones that we talked about? Mm -hmm. Acetate, aceto, acetoacetate, acetate, and beta hydroxybutyrate. So we can take those ketone bodies and we can take we can, we can shuttle those through the blood to muscle and the brain, and the brain can take those in and use it directly for, for ATP production. So that's how the ketogenic diet works, is you have a lack of carbohydrates, so you take what we call Krebs cycle products, and you divert them into the gluconeogenic pathway, and then acetyl-CoA has nothing there to bind with, and so it's converted to those ketones or ketone bodies that we can use. So it's just the acetyl-CoA that becomes a ketone body? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So ketone body and ketones is not the same as a keto acid. That's Keep those completely separate. Keto acids pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, all of these things are, and I'm not a chemist, but they're called, they're also called keto acids. So I can't explain that because I, I don't understand the chemistry of, of why it's a keto acid, but I know that these are called keto acids, which is different from ketones or ketone bodies that we're getting from acetyl-CoA. So that's, they're different. That makes sense. Any, any other questions? Okay, so could we spend the last uh, little bit just working on? Okay, so again, exercise B. What was the slide you want to look at for that on 4B? It's like slide 14, something like that. Go there. Or slide 20. Yeah, slide, yeah, slide 20. And then um, the other one was exercise E. So is the phalic cycle versus the Cori cycle, what's the difference? 
Thalig cycle versus Cori cycle. Cori cycle is lactate to glucose. Thalig cycle is alanine to glucose. Um, I think that you should keep them because it's going to be helpful for you to study. But I'd like to see you try and finish up while you're here. Does anyone else need another one? That's 4B and E, please. Yes, 4B and E, please. Get you, you want to start on num on B. So step one is would be E as in A. So in this step three, you have the electrons move through the bottom cell?
is correct. Good job. Is Aka the other guest? It might be. Started on the E, uh, exercise E. Uh, beta oxidation would be G at the end of this. Genesis ones. All done, Ty? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Doing okay. Yeah. Like, it's just when you see all of it, I'm like, okay, just break it down. A little it thing. Is, these sheets to study with. Yeah, so we're getting 
oxidative delamination is that this opposite of oxidative phosphorylation. Huh. So, so that's we haven't got to that yet, but that would be C is in cap. On oxidative deamination, we need amino acid to a keto acid plus ammonia, NH3 is ammonia. So then oxidative phosphorylation, can you say that that means it's water? Uh, that would be A. So the other protein one is D, that's transamination. So that's a little bit different. D is in dog. Then hydrolysis is the breakdown of H2. Oh, because I dissolved or something. Yeah, there's water. Oh, good lord. Okay. Oh, you're going to be fine. Other, where does ATP come from? Each step of glycolysis. Oh. You'll be fine. <laughs> Cycle. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> yes, the first part's a little oh, yeah. That's a long three minutes. <laughs> three kilopons. So next year you get to deal with one of the masks on. So glycolysis is glucose to pyruvic acid. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. This purpose of this is just to kind of help it all come together and review. I'm pregnant? I don't 